There we go. So thank you for coming. Today's talk, and I'll try not to, I pace a lot and walk around a lot, so I'll try not to get in front of the screen too much. But today's talk is really about accessibility from a different point of view. It's about more of the business side of it, about understanding why it's important to your company as well as to the community. So let's start off with a few assumptions. You're all good people. Everybody wants to do the right thing for people. We are civically minded. We want to do what's right. But a lot of times, whether it be your client's budget or your own, accessibility keeps getting pushed back. And it's not that people aren't good and don't want to do what's right. It's because, well, if they have a choice between this larger 80% of the market versus this smaller percentage, what's the ROI? They have to answer to people. All of these things influence our choices. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how to reframe accessibility into something that's frankly easier to sell internally. So with that first, hi, my name is Donna. I'm from Canopy Studios. We like doing good with great things and wonderful people and um, really impactful websites, wonderful clients. We're um, really fortunate to be a part of this team. And that's me. My name is Donna Bungard. I have alphabet soup over there. Um, basically, I love learning. I love accessibility. I like people. I genuinely believe digital is about people. We all, um, or at least in my space, we all grumble about our, our teenagers looking at their phones all the time. Everything is you know, getting siloed. I believe digital is about people. It really is. It's about the people at the end, other end of that device and how to connect them and bring them together. And whether it be more of a user journey in a professional sense or just me spouting off on one of my blogs. That. So, here's the, the short version is accessibility compliance really isn't optional anymore. But we can talk about it in terms of the, both empathy and value. There is value to companies that take on an accessible web presence. So what we'll talk about today is heroes versus anti-heroes. Quick overview of what accessibility is. Discuss it in terms of, again, those business senses. It's not charity, people. And help you frame it for those conversations and where we go from there. So heroes versus anti-heroes. A hero, I actually read a book about this recently, talking about the archetype of the hero in terms of, you know, Socrates or something. And... You know, it's this wonderful person who is selfless and is this beautiful archetype, whereas the anti-hero kind of is a little more emotionally driven and does it maybe a little for themselves, too. Maybe they've got their own way of looking at it. So keeping that framework in mind and how I'm saying we need to be anti-heroes, let's just take a step back. Accessibility isn't charity. These are successful people with disposable income who are a part of your market. We need to respect them. We're not, oh honey, you can't see as well, or oh, you can't hear my sister. My sister's half deaf. Well, not actually, just hard of hearing is how she identifies, whatever. My point is growing up, do you know what my compassion itself did? I walked up behind her and played jingle bells with the, with the feedback on her hearing aids. This is not feeling bad. This is, I talked louder so she'd help me carry the groceries. This was not a charity thing. I didn't want to carry all the groceries myself. This is the same framework. Your, your, your target market are disabled individuals and they need our respect. You know, the, all of our users, and, and I'm a content strategist as well, and all of our users are, I always say, the heroes of their own stories. When I'm on Amazon, the hero, I'm the hero of my own story. Now, my story was buying a t-shirt the other day. It's not an exciting story, but I was still the hero of it. I was able to go through the conversion process, and when I get home, I will have a t-shirt waiting for me. Yay me, I get my reward at the end. This I actually learned about in the philosophy of a book. Um, Barbara Gordon in the DC comic universe was a librarian by trade, became Batgirl, and when the Joker shot her and she lost use of her legs, she became Oracle and the head of several other female superheroes, the Huntresses. She became more of a powerful figure after being disabled. I, I'm, I'm stressing this because I really feel as though, as much as I love being a good human 
and being an inclusive person and, and making accommodations to meet whatever communication style that has. I mean, my, my husband's a huge introvert. I, I speak differently to him sometimes because clearly I'm not. And you just, I'm happy to adapt, but this, in terms of our websites, in terms of our websites of evolution and growth, and bringing accessibility to the top of the list instead of keep getting pushed down with those budget constraints, we need to look at how we're, how we're talking about accessibility. So as your anti-hero, you're being respectful of your organization's bottom line. You're showing them the value of having an accessible web presence. You can still be an advocate for accessible content and accessible websites. You should be. People need to be spoken for. Advocating is wonderful. It doesn't mean you're the hero, but you're advocating, and that's a beautiful thing still. And we're going to talk about how we can t uh, look at that ROI. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. I'll go through this part quickly. Accessibility, website accessibility is about breaking down barriers. There's um, four general categorizations of cognitive, uh, visual, audio, and mobility. Um, and those can present in a variety of ways, often paired together. Um, you know, those with autism typically have other focuses. People with ADHD are prone to the, uh, what have you. There's a bunch of different pieces of the puzzle here. Um, there's also physical things, and there's really user experience issues too. I don't know how many of you are really excited. I don't have a cracked screen anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but that cracked screen, what it was, is I managed to crack the screen under the screen protector. Don't know how I did it, it was beautiful. I could still not cut myself. But occasionally when I'd move my, my finger, it wasn't exactly moving where I thought it was. These are user experience. Having the wide, the space between buttons helped me. And, and I don't identify as a disabled user. These are, these are things for your user experience too. And that's part of the reason we need to keep in mind, one of the things we have to keep in mind that an accessible website is not about the 20%. It's about all of the users and having that inclusive presence. So 15% of the global population does self-identify as, as being disabled. And we have our guidelines. US 508 compliance is a website, a WCAG 2.0 AA, whereas the more Canadian um, regulations, I, I have a, in a later slide, I think it's C81, is WCAG 2.1. Um, a lot of the European countries are 2.1 as well. And the levels, the more A's, the more strict the things. So, okay, we did that, we did the baseline. Honestly, I kind of looking around the room, I get the feeling most people understand where we're going. So, let's look at some of the statistics of what other organizations have lost. You know, the music industry, $2.5 million because people couldn't buy their tickets online. Um, vision loss had $175 billion of disposable income. And this is all B to C. And B to B, it's even, uh, it's even more because of the, frankly, the budgets are bigger usually than our individuals, at least in my case. Um, no, but we're losing out on billions of dollars a year in active, in, in active purchases, which means that we're looking at $8 trillion in the B2C world alone. That, that doesn't account for the budgets people manage at a professional level. This is huge, and as much as you know, as much as I want the world to have captioning so my sister can, can understand the video, I also, as a professional, want my clients $8 trillion. I mean, I want my clients to be able to take advantage of that as well. So, they're the heroes of their own story. The disabled communities are the heroes of their own stories. They don't need us to be that. They're active out there. They're working at, they're, they're working professionals, they're all of these people who just need us to respect the fact that they're, this is no different in some ways than making sure your set is responsive for all of us who couch surf and shop at night and then maybe regret the next day. So your budget matters. You need to be able to talk about accessibility in terms of your budget. 
yes, you now have this framework. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of profit. So let's talk about building it in. Because again, you wouldn't build a website that isn't responsive right now. You wouldn't. You'd lose too many people. It's baked into your marketing though. You're asking for wireframes. You want to see the mobile experience app. You want to see that first. Then you want to see the rest. You're baked in some accessibility. It's accessible for people on their phones, but some accessibility issues already. You need to bake in accessibility in terms of the disabled community as well. So SEO. 93% of people find web, web pages through search engines. So with that, search engines are blind. Search engines are deaf but they're learning and they're paying attention to the words you use. This is why content is so huge. They're paying attention, they're becoming smarter. Every algorithm release is supposed to be more like people, which is a little scary, but absolutely fantastic at the same time. They're looking for relevance. They're looking for value, just like your end users. And they need the alt text. They need links with meaning. Search engines need all of the same information. They need transcripts. They need all of this to be able to scan your site and understand the value of it and therefore output it to the end user on the search engine result page. So, the 411, the alt text that is descriptive links. Read more doesn't work. If you have maybe hidden text at the end that just auto-populates the title, say if it's a list of blogs with a read more, if you want that for your visual experience, fine, but you can always hide text after that just auto-inputs the same title, so that way Google and um, screen readers read, read more about five ways to improve your blogging experience or something. Uh, your heading structure matters. Google pays attention to that. They want to know what's most important and less important and a little less and just text on your site. And that's your H1, your H2, and all your H3s. And then your content. In the reading level, words matter. Um, we always hear content, I, I keep repeating myself, content, yay, because I love words. But reading level matters. It's going to tell, reading level tells your people your users or your site visitors, you know, hey, come on, let's do this. Let's take this next step towards conversion. Wow, I almost fell. That was fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna walk this way now. So wow, let's take that next step towards conversion. Whereas it might tell somebody who's maybe not your target market, no really, it's me, not you. That's what words have the power to do. So there's of course the legal side. Lots of, uh, lots of talk lately about the legal side. So yeah, C81, I was right, um, uses 2.1 in Canada. Um, US, of course, a 508 is 2.0. Um, we, of course, want to all start going to 2.1 now. So that way, when, when the 508 compliance catches up, we're not scrambling. I mean, we've all gone through the refresh ones, right? So yeah, in the last three years, has been 23% of the litigations. And that's just the litigations and settlements. There's complaints filed with OC, uh, offices of civil rights. They're um, at university levels, at this level, at that. There's a lot of other things that aren't included in there. But it's all exploding in the last three years. Two of the most popular, Winn-Dixie in 2017, it was kind of a uh, trend center because they said, well, wait, you, this website is a portal to their brick and mortar location, therefore it has to be as accessible as any doorway. It's another portal. So because of that, it was kind of a trend center and opened the door for a lot of the litigation that we're seeing now. And then of course there's Domino's saying, wait a second, all the rules are a little gray. We're gonna spend you know, this time trying to fight it and what they put out said that it wasn't even so much that they just didn't feel they were clearly defined enough. Nonetheless, it's not changing it. They lost or they were refused to be heard actually in the Superior Court. And then, yeah, 177% increase. So, where do we begin? We begin at the beginning. Uh, that started at the very beginning. Anyway, 
where do we... <laughs> Thank you, somebody, for laughing. I appreciate that. Um, so where do we begin? We begin with strategy, just like we do any other website we're working on, right? We always have some sort of discovery or roadmap or things like that. Well, right, like you would any other um, processes, you measure twice to cut once. And when you need to talk about this, you mention the fact that online searches, 50% or it's projected 50% of searches will be on voice activated over the, in the next year. I know I was talking to my phone half of the drive to this camp. I, I, it happens all the time. Um, 1.5 billion people in the aging population in the next 30 years. I'm not going to make comments about anyone but me, but I'm going to be a part of that group in the next 30 years. I want to be able to see the websites or, or experience them. And then videos. Videos on Facebook. 100 million hours. All of this matters because these are all areas in which accessibility has a huge impact. A huge impact. And it's also, well, it's just part of your marketing, right? You want to reach 1.5 billion people. You want to be, have a better chance in 50% of the searches. You want to have that experience as a marketer. So with your branding, branding is all about consistency, right? It's the cornerstone, it's who you are, it's your identity, it's how people see you. Mm. So things to keep in mind are make sure your brand colors are accessible. Uh, there's a lot of variances in how people see. Make sure the words are written. Again, content matters. It matters, it says, you know, hey, let's be friends or hey, it was really nice to meet you, see you. That consistent process in the representation, because representation matters. If you look at the fact that other organizations, larger brands are already adopting the fact that representation matters, they're, they're celebrating it. Um, Dove goes forward to make a point to celebrate the differences in, in women's bodies. Uh, Xbox wanted to showcase a new controller at a Super Bowl ad. These aren't things people aren't talking about. These are big part of the everyday existence of major brands. And it needs to be more and more because when people see or experience things that speak directly to them in their lives, they're more likely to make a connection with you. I recently read that Generation Z is incredibly driven by that connection. They don't necessarily want to buy from a vendor. They're willing to pay more because they feel that connection, they feel that social awareness from the organization. So this shift isn't, again, about making sure everyone feels good, it's so that way that you make the connection to go to the next step in your conversion funnel. So an easy way to do this is through your personas. Bake accessibility features in. Acknowledge the fact that if you have a gentleman over 65, there's a very good chance he's going to have a vision problem. Frankly, anybody over 65, if you look at the CDC statistics, we're, you know, just, just go buy the glasses now if you see a cute pair. I mean, but bake it in. If your persona fits within this range, and, and Cornell has this really cool tool and what you do is you just put in some general demographics and they're gonna output the estimated percentage of people who experience those issues within that area. So when you're making your personas, right at that strategy level, bake it in because what you can do then is when you're presenting it to your clients or your team or your stakeholders, whomever they are, you can be like, you know, we have a large percentage of people who are going to be visually impaired. Let's up that text a little bigger on our wireframes so that way you're not doing it later. Or let's make sure that contrast is a little bit stronger. You know, this passes, but maybe we want to really make sure it passes. It's not, it's empowering your users. Recently I had a, a client with a donation form and they had small, non-bolded white text over an image which 
I'm like, looking at your at your persona here, you have a lot of, you know, I'm the younger part of that demographic, so it was what, like 40 to 60 year olds who are going from a link they see on TV to this page. I'm like, they're not gonna be able to see that. Can we make everything larger? And we did, and it helped. It was just keeping this in mind here will spiral through the whole website process and help you, again, sell it internally, showcase the value, and then test as you go. We all have QA processes, right? So when you're looking at your wireframes, look, okay, are, are those buttons maybe a little bit too close together? If you don't feel comfortable saying that, you know, users with Parkinson's may have a hard time clicking it, say, you know, hey, my screen is cracked. It, how you bake it in is up to you. It depends on the client. It depends on the feel. But it's important. And then your design analysis is a lot of color, a lot of that feel there, making sure you don't have small text over busy pictures. And then test as you build from a development standpoint. Make sure to keyboard tab and nothing else. I mean, most of, well, most of the room I see has Macs. Mac VoiceOver comes installed. You know, you don't have to be an expert user to be like, well, I have this thing yelling at me that I'm stuck on the same link for 15 minutes. Maybe there's a problem. And you can work with it. I, I figure with my level of screen reader, screen reader usage, blah, 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 screen reader usage, that uh, if I can get through a page, somebody who actually knows what they're doing probably can too. So test. Take the few minutes. It doesn't have to be three hours of testing because you have to plan for what you can't see. And then strongly suggest testing with native users. How often in our daily lives do we say, you know what, let me just take care of that for you. Why? Because we do that every day. It's me watching my children cook or something. It's like, you know, of course I'm trying not to take over them. But for the most part, in my internal monologue, is, oh my gosh, let me do that for you. I do this every day. I know how to do that better, more effectively. What makes us think that people who use screen readers or other assistive technologies every day aren't going to understand what they need better than we do? They're going to be able to, to perceive issues that we never will. Even if we're using the screen reader with our eyes closed, we're unless you're really, really good. You're not going to have that same experience. And then content strategy, because I can't not talk about words. I love them. Long-standing love affair with words. It's just a thing. So give context. You want to give value. You want to give context. Out of context, that last saying is going to sound really weird. But in context of the speak, hopefully it only sounds a little odd. Always let the user know where they are, why it's important to them. I mean, this is just strategy for all users. But when you're considering things like a video, are the, do you have the captions? Do you have the transcripts? How is this going to work for the end user? What does this con mean in context of the larger page? What does that chart mean? If someone, I don't know if you've ever heard a table on a screen reader, it goes, Row one, sell one, row two, sell two, row three, and so on and so forth. Um, you have to be able to give them understanding of what they're looking at, why it's important, and you know, do you have your row headers working? Do you have your column headers working? So that they understand when it says, you know, row 27, column four, you remember what on earth you're trying to gather. So always give context in that larger scope. You know, keep it focused. We all want to find user journeys. We all want that strong, you know, this is your pathway to conversion. This is your pathway to a micro conversion. Read our blog article and sign up for a newsletter. You have all of these things, so keep it focused. If you have are, are working for people with um, an audience that is likely to have ADHD, if you work with maybe higher ed, the number of people who are diagnosed as either ADHD or high functioning autistic disorder, spectrum disorder, it's a larger number than it used to be. Um, not that necessarily it's gotten worse, but they're able to identify it a lot more effectively now. They're going to be, any, because anybody may be dealing with cognitive challenges. Maybe they can see and read it fine, 
but their abil ability to focus, to have that ability to go through. If, if you're working on a university site, maybe going through that process of learning about how to get to a tour and come see, you know, these are brilliant kids, and they might have a hard time getting through your site if there's too many distractions, too many, oh, by the ways. It can throw somebody off. And then they'll go on a tangent, and they'll never get back, and everyone loses out. And again, empower. It, it, it really is about empowering your user to be the hero, and it doesn't matter who the user is. You know, um, the, ex the example I love here is the one I wrote down here about allowing the social sharing. I one time was trying to do a little analysis on a, a blog page that we made for, not a canopy, this is a million years ago, a blog page for a, town, for a client. And I'm listening to it with a screen reader and I purposely had my thing tilted so I couldn't see because I cheat because I can and I don't mean to. It's just instinctual that if there's a screen in front of me, I stare at it. I am visually capable, therefore I do so. Um, so anyway, so I'm not looking and I'm listening and it's like, okay, share on Facebook, share on Twitter, share on blah, 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 blah. And then it reads me the blog article and that was, you know, then I go into the footer menu and all of that. And I just asked the developer, I'm like, why on earth would I have shared that before I read it? I never share any, I don't, I'm picky about what I share. I, don't, I wouldn't share an article just based on the title or subtitle, but that was the first thing the screen reader read. There's things that automatic testing can't catch. That is a perfect example of one. You need to think about that user journey from all perspectives. And that's the beauty of content strategy because that's really what you're doing. So, where do we go from here? We continue to look. And I always start with strategy first because though analysis or assessment is very strong, I think saying to everybody that we need to do a website assessment. We need to check everything that's wrong and fix it. That doesn't help you sell it uphill, people. I, I mean, really, if we're looking at our budgets, if we're looking at our SEO, if we're looking at what is the return, how many people are going to really benefit, what is the strongest part of this, how is it going to impact the user journey, how is it going to do all of this? You need to do a strategy and you can make that argument of this has value, not because it's charity, not because it's just something we should do, which yes, it is something you should do, totally. But because it is a business piece of the puzzle, we are improving our SEO, we are improving our customer outreach, we are improving our user journey, we are gonna be in front of the screen pretty soon. I walk around too much. Um, we're doing all of these things, you're making the argument at every step of the way. So that way, when it comes down to, okay, we need this kind of UX improvement. Well, you know why you need it. You want to change the development of something, you know why. Or maybe you go from strategy and skip around back to analysis to see who on earth is being not accounted for. So you go through this and you start with the strategy and you go through the process, but it doesn't end because you need to educate Content editors have a huge role in this. You make a beautiful site. You give it to people. They work on it. They upload a light green pic background picture with dark green text on it and wonder why nobody understands what's going on. Or, you know, granted, Drupal 8 has the uh, alt text as default, but maybe they have really poor links where people don't understand the context of if I click this link, where am I gonna go? So you need to keep people educated. And you have to keep going through this process over and over. It's not always about turnover. Maybe it's about advancements in technologies. Maybe there's new technologies. Maybe there's all these wonderful pieces of the puzzle that work together. And frankly, just like content strategy, almost every website out there will have sprawl at some point. We've all seen it. The menu starts getting longer and longer, the drop-down menu. We've seen it happen. The same thing can go happen with accessibility, where you have to do that stop and check. So that analysis, that assessment, it has to happen. But don't, don't start with that. 
understand why it's important to your organization first. So, does anybody have any thoughts, questions? On the voice search? Yes. Uh, the 50% you're speaking about, is that sort of, um, when we're thinking about our own sites, is that like across all digital assets or is it just sort of like, you know, Google and stuff like this, or like if we have a site search that's looking at content within, we should also think that within a site like one of ours, that 50% will probably try to use their voice on, on the search bar. That statistic was specifically for search engines. I believe it was based off of Google. Gotcha. That said, Google's? all the Googles. All the Googles? All of them. Gotcha. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts or what have you? What would you say to a team where we generally receive designs from agencies and as much as I would have loved for them to be thinking this way, they weren't. It was more flashy and check this out and blah, 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 blah. Um, and then what happens generally is, well, you guys haven't thought this, that, or the other thing. And then the same thing, like brand comes back and says, well, that's going to cost me more agency dollars because now they're reworking stuff. You, you know, too bad they didn't know this. And so for us, it's like, well, too bad you didn't hire a company that knew about accessibility. But <laughs> what, do you, what, kind of, how would, what kind of advice would you give for those situations? Build it into the RFP. No, yeah, it's not ours. It's not ours. yours? You don't have that option? Um, but our, that's, a, we, we, that's a great piece of advice so that we can move to like a procurement side and have them build that. Yeah, if, if it, my, that's my first thought is to have things um, and give, you know, samples may include you know, functionality, con color contrast, blah, 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 you know, just things like you that. You can go as far as just saying in the RFP, like all designs must adhere to, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like yeah, exactly. Stuff like this. Yeah, that was, um, so if you're dealing with it after the fact, do you have wiggle room to make edits to build compliance in post through the development process? Yeah, we can do things, well, we can do things like, uh, you know, they came up with a transcript originally when they made their video, like, but then it might have kind of got, gone the way of the side after filming. So we just asked them to go update their transcripts so the transcripts are available. Because um, they usually would have not included it as something they sent to us. Where did, where are the, uh, is it a YouTube video? Uh, no, it's usually hosted on Brightcove. Okay. I don't know Bright Cove as well. Do they have like auto captioning? Like oh, auto captioning. The problem is, is that read through it after. By the way, just don't ever just go with <laughs> yeah, auto captioning. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. So welcome to New Jersey. I work in a pharmaceutical company. So <laughs> we, can't, we, can't, we can't do anything that's auto anything. It's got to be approved by and submitted to the FDA before it's done. We can't let an engine accidentally misinterpret like uh, a big long medical word as the name of a candy instead or something like that. Yeah, no, that's... You said Snickers. No, I didn't say Snickers. I said Jingles. Like, you know, it's like, it's like that sort of thing can't happen. So. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, no. Um, I would... Are the transcripts vastly different or are they... No. I mean, if you're asking, like, what, are, what can we do on the dev side, do, we can encourage things that, you know, hey, you guys just need to take one more thing, which is just update the transcript, just fix the woulds to shoulds and whatever the direction yeah. changed, and give that to us, and you kind of up your game a little bit from an like, accessibility perspective. Or, like, when we get sketch files, we put it through the contrast ratio checker and try to send it back and say, hey, listen, these, these ones here are kind of but bordering, the brand yeah, bordering going out of range from a double-A perspective. Like, can you guys dial that back? What about, what about this? What about who is going to be purchasing the drugs? Mm -hmm. um, is it the doctors or the individuals? Uh, the, it's both. Maybe because it's doctors, you definitely have an age percentage. And I'm going to guess that there's still predominantly male in at least some fields. Mm -hmm. At which point, eight percent of northern European men of northern European descent are um, inherently colorblind of one type or another. Sure. So, between the age and the potential for colorblindness, you can make the branding company of this is a this is a percentage of people this is negatively impacting, and therefore, we are alienating these people. You're spending your brand money on. Therefore, can we fix this? Yeah, absolutely. That might be an option. Yeah, and some of the stuff, we're trying to move the stuff up the chain so that procurement and these guys educate marketers before they get their bad design. I mean, their <laughs> stuff. 
they're visually engaging and <clears throat> practical, maybe, design. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right, well, um, holler if you need anything, but before we go, I of course have to uh, suggest. Oh, so um, on Saturday it is the contribution day here at New Jersey Camp. Everyone is welcome. It doesn't matter if you're a coder, you can be a marketer, you can be a sales client, you can be an accessibility expert. And we're going to be doing a first time contribution workshop. Not at all like the one at DrupalCon. It will be very easy, very, um, <laughs> yeah. very, uh, you will leave knowing how to do something, you know, so that will be in the morning and then moving into contribution day on Saturday. And um, I'm not a coder and I give it back to Drupal, so it's sort of that case study, you know, if I can do it, anyone can do it. So um, I invite everyone over and there's free lunch, so. And, and in truth, guys, I, I I've walked away from coding, and I one time um, a year or so ago was contributing at one of these things with adding, correcting the grammar on on a plug uh, on a module page. So, and really, anybody can do it. And it first time can also be it's been three years since my last contribution, and maybe I don't have anything set up and I forget how to do it. So, please feel free to join us. And so, thank you. <laughs>